Hi, everyone around the world. Look at these two big, fluffy, wonderful loves I've got in my uh, lap tonight. And I have great news. We've broken through 189,000 subscribers. We're almost up to 190,000. And many of you are now sending me images from your night watches where you have binoculars or telescopes or cameras ready to document sky mysteries. And hopefully there will be clear weather for most of us this coming Thursday, November 18th into early Friday morning, November 19th. That's when the longest near total lunar eclipse in over 500 years will unfold over three and a half hours visible to all of North America, New Zealand, and Eastern Australia. The Earth's shadow will begin moving over the moon at 10.02 p.m. Pacific time and in all other time zones across the United States. As more and more of Earth's shadow covers the moon, it could become a deep, beautiful, haunting orange color. As it reaches near total eclipse at 1.02 a.m. Pacific, which is 4.02 a.m. East Coast, early Friday morning. At that moment, 97.4% of the moon's diameter will be in the Earth's dark umbra shadow. And leading into the lunar eclipse in Los Angeles will be radio host Jimmy Church on his Fade to Black broadcast to celebrate the official release Thursday night of a new documentary entitled The Observers. I encourage all of you to see this. I'm one of the observers and we filmed in summer 2021 when the 180 day countdown to a Pentagon report about UFO UAPs was in the news. Now at the end of 2021, and after the disappointing, weak government report to Congress was released the end of June. The combined voices of the observers in this new 90-minute documentary builds a strong case for the reality of an alien presence on Earth and beyond. Jimmy will celebrate by having a few minutes with each of us in the film, which includes in alphabetical order Jimmy Church, Rich Dolan, Louis Elizondo, John Greenwald, William Henry, me, Linda Moulton Howe, Deborah Jordan Cobble, Whitley Strieber, and Jesse Ventura, Wisconsin governor from 1999 to 2003. Deb Cobble is one of the abduction cases that Missing Time author Bud Hopkins featured in his 1987 book, Intruders, The Incredible Visitations at Copley Woods. I have known Deb since the 1980s and in fact met her at Bud Hopkins' apartment in New York. And I asked her if she would come into the Observer's Project where she eloquently speaks for every man, woman, and child who has had face-to-face -face encounters with other non-human intelligences. Now to order the observers, we have placed this link in tonight's broadcast information, genie.us forward slash the observers. And Ian can put this link in the chat. I have long compared the complexity of UFOs and the alien presences on Earth to a 16-layer chess game with hundreds of chess pieces. The observers dig into internecine warfare topics in the Pentagon that keep the public from the truth that we are not alone in this universe. We observers want to reach the public with real truths about other intelligences using Earth as a laboratory in which humans and animals are taken with neutralizing gravity beam technology into advanced alien craft. Bloodless, trackless, wild, and domestic animal mutilations have been reported around the world since at least the 1960s associated with UFO UAPs. Paralleling the animal mutilations have been human abductions by non-humans into UFO UAP craft probable reasons for abductions and animal mutilations 
include genetic harvesting, experimentation, and hybrid production. The U.S. government knows all this. They know this has happened and is happening now, but has always had strict policies of denial since World War II. And that's when pilots and government leaders realized there were strange Foo Fighters and other unknown aerial craft moving in Earth skies at astounding speeds, making 90 degree turns and stopping in midair. Nothing that humans could do then or can do now. And UFOs seem everywhere these days. For example, SpaceX founder Elon Musk tweeted on Monday, November 8th, quote, at Elon Musk, hopefully UFO photo was the SpaceX Dragon capsule and not a donut UFO invasion. This strange blue glowing donut shaped UFO is what Elon Musk was tweeting about that may be on November 8th, it had something to do with his SpaceX Dragon capsule endeavor that was on its way back with four astronauts from the International Space Station to land in the Gulf. However, the photographer of the round blue UFOs is a satellite tracker in the Netherlands who calculated that the SpaceX splash site in the Gulf was at least 5,000 miles from Zurich. So too far away to be the explanation of the concentric circle blue UFO that remains a mystery. And then the UK Mirror headlined on November 12th, quote, man bemused after doorbell camera films, triangular UFO flying over the street, close quote. The smart doorbell security camera owner is Matt Doty a resident of St. Albans, Hertfordshire, about 23 miles northwest of London. He checked his security camera after a motion detection alert and discovered it had recorded a formation of three bright lights in triangular pattern. This pattern of three bright star-like lights moving in a triangle in the evening, and then Matt called his dad who checked an online flight tracker and reported back that there was, quote, no plane traffic, close quote, in the sky at all over St. Albans, England. On November 4th, 2021, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand introduced an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act to establish an official Defense Department office to study UFOs. The importance of seriously studying the UFO UAP phenomena with physicists, engineers, biologists, archaeologists, geneticists across the entire academic spectrum is summed up in this June 27th, 2021, quote from the Director of National Intelligence at the end of the 180-day UFO UAP countdown, when the DNI admitted that 143 of 144 UFO cases could not be explained, quote, Whatever this is, it is more complex than we can possibly imagine. And that complexity of UFOs and UAPs includes the taking of Homo sapiens sapien humans as well as wild and domestic animals up and down inside glowing beam transport technologies. That would explain why there are no tracks around mutilated animal bodies, not even the dead animal zone tracks. Why bloodless animal mutilations on Earth by ETs? 
I have thought for four decades, after my many investigations of animal mutilations, that there are at least two main reasons, genetic harvesting and food sustenance. There are geographical locations that have repeated high strangeness. One of those haunted regions in the United States is the Bridgewater Triangle in southeastern Massachusetts that extends from Rehoboth and Freetown, extending northeast to Brockton, Whitman, and Abington. Recently, I was contacted by a man who lived near the Triangle in the fall of 2018, only three years ago. His primary work was in healthcare, but he also helped a farmer across the road from his house herd cattle. When one of the cattle went missing, he found himself staring for the first time in his life at a bloodless, trackless cattle mutilation. The farmer called the Massachusetts State Police to investigate, and his next shock came when two men showed up in a black government suburban. The Massachusetts source said he wanted me to know about what happened, but he doesn't want his real name, face, or voice publicly associated with the animal mutilation. He asked me to call him Ted Collins, a fictitious name, and to electronically alter his voice. I live in the Bridgewater Triangle, Massachusetts. And the Bridgewater Triangle is known for UFOs, the paranormal. And when I was young, I used to hang out with this kid from Blackstone, which is out in the farm country in Massachusetts. His grandmother taught me how to ride horses and drive cattle. So I know how to do that. And I know how to ride a horse, and I'm pretty good at it. And I know how to drive cattle with a horse and a dog and a bull whip. This is how it happened. I was driving cattle. And I drove the cattle into the pen. This guy had like 55 head of cattle. Well, there was only 54 when I counted. And I asked the guy that was with me to count. And he said, yeah, there's only 54. And so I said, well, we're going to have to find it. Because we can't tell the guy that owns all these cattle that there's only 54 when he's supposed to have 55. So I rode out. And I rode out for a good 20 minutes before I came to the animal on the top of a hill. There was a hill, and it was right on top, like someone had just plucked it up and plumped it down. And there was no footprints, nothing. They are so neat. There's no blood and there's no fluid. They're just excisions. Right, right. What was exactly missing on this particular animal that you remember firsthand? Well, it's been burnt into my mind, and I've actually had nightmares about it. The entire flesh of the skull, the skull was completely defleshed. The milk sac, so it was a female, the milk sac was completely excised without puncturing the innards. Was it a square cut or a circular cut? It was oval, like an egg. And the eyeball was missing, the left eyeball. And was there any excision of tissue around where the eyeball would have been? In other words, a lot of these animals have a circle, a perfect circle of tissue that lifts off. There's no eyeball, no eyelids, no eyelashes. It's a circle removal of all tissue. Well, it looked as if it had been sucked right out. No damage to the eyelashes or the tissue where the eye was out. Just the removal of the eyeball? Yes. Okay. And what else was removed? Its anus was cored out. No blood. We had a vet tech come out and look at it. The heart was gone. And the vet tech said, Blowfly did that. And I just looked at her and I said, I don't think so. And she was like, watch on YouTube or look it up online. And I said, I don't think that Blowfly did that. This cow went missing for two days. I don't think in two days the maggots ate the entire tissue. Anyway, so we found it, and I radioed back to the rancher that we had found it and that he'd better come out here, told him where we were, and the farmer came out, and he picked up his cell phone and called the state police. Well, the state police came, and then the state police radioed into the barracks to call Otis Air Force Base 
And then OSI came. And OSI told me and the other hand that we didn't see a thing, we don't remember a thing, and we don't talk about it. And I was just like, I can't say that I don't remember. He's like, well, you're going to. What possible right does somebody in the military have to say to an American citizen that they are not to report an animal mutilation? Exactly. They came up in a big suburban and, like, flashed their badges and showed off that they had shoulder holsters. And then they took them all to the main house and said, you are not going to tell anybody about this. You didn't see anything. You don't remember. And if you ever do talk about it, you will find you'll be alone some night and you'll meet your end. And I was like... (laughs) They actually threatened you that way? Oh, yeah. They said, because I wanted to go to the Plimpton paper about it. I was that freaked out. And they actually, the guy said, the government has a very long arm and we will find you. And did you say, why would you be saying that to me? I'm an American citizen. I did. I did. I said, you're military and I'm a civilian. You can't tell me what to do. And he said, try me. And how was he dressed? He was dressed in a dark gray striped suit with black sunglasses. We're talking like very boxy looking, okay? And he had on a tie with an OSI pin pinning the tie to his shirt. And he had a bald head. He was completely bald. And he said, try me. So I'm trying him. Well, what happened at that moment? Did you just turn around and walk away or what? I said to him, I'm going to call the Pentagon, and I have a grandfather that was an administrator at the Pentagon, and I really am uncomfortable with what you're saying. And he said, they'll tell you the same thing. And I said, I don't think so. And then my buddy was like, just let it die. And I'm like, I don't want to stop. I don't like this man. And (laughs) I take it that this man who was ordering you to keep your mouth shut about the animal mutilation that he was showing you identification from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations? Mm Mm-hmm. That's what he showed you? When he got out of the Suburban, he said, well, it looks like we have another one. And I said, what do you mean by another one? I had never heard of it before this date back in 2018, the fall of 2018. The typical is... They call it the sky-facing side of the animal. And let's say that this animal, since the left eyeball was removed, it would be lying on its right side. It would be left ear removed down to the skull, the left eyeball, and sometimes the tissue around the eye. The left jaw flesh would be completely stripped down to clean jawbone. The udder removed in a female the penis and or testicles removed in a male, Mm -hmm. not penetrating into the abdomen, but they are called cookie cutter cuts because they only go into upper hide and everything is removed like a cookie cutter. And then usually in 90 some percent of the cases, the rectal tissue or rectal and vaginal in females are removed in a 18 inch deep stovepipe cut in which there is no blood or any fluid going into the body. The sky-facing side was the side that was up. The left side was up. Animal mutilations have been occurring around the world in both hemispheres since at least the 1960s, along with intimidation by police, sheriffs, military and government agencies who have told people, ranging from ranchers to uh, other people who have come to mutilation sites, to not talk, that they are not seeing anything. And here is a headline I used in my first book, An Alien Harvest, that was released in 1989. This news headline was dated July 15, 1984, in the Perth, Australia, Sunday Times, quote, cover-up alleged over UFO-linked animal slaughter. 
many reports of UFOs and strange lights in the sky. Farmers in the Adelaide Hills around Perth have discovered mutilated animal corpses and burn marks on the ground. In one incident, researchers say a farmer discovered four cows with holes drilled into their skulls and the brains removed. Adelaide UFO researcher Colin Norris said, quote, I have been told by the army and ask that the farmers remain quiet about the animals and that the army would cover the whole thing up, close quote. Mr. Norris said pod marks in the ground and burnt treetops indicated a UFO craft had landed, implying near mutilated animals. More recently, in early June this year, investigative reporter Ross Colhart at Australia's Seven News in Sydney released a book entitled In Plain Sight that includes UFOs, UAPs, and Australia cattle. And this is a mutilation mystery that has gone from the 20th century to today. And in this particular case, he got a vet, and during uh, one of his interviews about several of the cattle mutilations on the Mick and Judy Cook property in North Queensland, a senior veterinarian told Ross, quote, it is definitely not an animal. These cuts are so precise that I strongly doubt even an experienced worker from the local abattoir could make wounds that are so exact, close quote. The vet pointed to a huge midline incision across the cow's abdomen and explained that when he investigated inside the animal, he discovered that the cow's third stomach, the omasum, was missing. But the prior rumen and reticulum stomachs were intact and not disturbed. The veterinarian said on the record, quote, that just can't be done. To get to the omasum, you need to move the two other stomachs. And I cannot comprehend how that could be done without spilling their contents or leaving a huge amount of blood on the ground. And there was none, close quote. It has always been the cleanness of the sites. I remember in 1979 when I started go to, going to my very first animal mutilations in Colorado when I was producing a strange harvest. And I remember that when a deputy, two deputies from a sheriff's office down near Walsenburg, Colorado, took the camera crew and I into a grove of willows and we had to push through to get to an animal that they said uh, had been there, they thought, for at least a week. And it was absolutely pristine with a perfect circle of flesh from the eye and perfect oval. Uh, it was a male. Uh, the testicles and penis had been removed. The rectum had been removed. And the animal was lying under thick trees. And the deputy said, this animal weighs probably 1,700 pounds, and 1,700 pounds coming through all of the branches, they would have broken. And we can't figure out how did anything get this animal inside all of these thick branches on the dirt with these excisions, and there's no blood, there are no tracks. How did they get it in here? And there was a sheriff up in uh, the Colorado Springs area that he told me that as the high strangeness in the animal mutilations were working out in Elbert County in Colorado, that he went uh, to the local airport as sheriff and asked to rent a, a Piper Cub kind of plane. And he said that what he wanted to do was he wanted to get permission to fly the plane with him, the sheriff, in the back seat with the deputy on the right and the pilot 
and they wanted to fly over where they were having these bloodless, trackless, strange mutilations quite frequently back in the 70s when he did this. And he said they took off, they had gotten the permission that they could shut off their lights for a certain small period of time because they wanted to fly without uh, being glowing light themselves in the sky. And he said, all of a sudden, there was a yell from the pilot. They were hooked in with radio. And the pilot said, look down on the left. And the sheriff moved over and he said, you could tell black against black. It was night and we're flying without lights, but you could still see a perfect black circle right under us. And I went over to the right window and there was the rest of the circle. And there was something perfectly circular right below us in the night. And it almost felt, he said, as if it were a cat and mouse game because we went up into the sky with permission to not use lights so we would not be seen, but whatever was in or controlling this big black circle that they assumed was a craft, almost like a joke, came right up under them and was going right with them. And the sheriff said, in all of his career as a sheriff, that that would probably scared him more than anything that had ever happened. And they landed very uh, soon after. If these are the kinds of associations that sheriffs and deputies were making back in the 60s, when there were, for the, in the San Luis Valley in Colorado, there were hundreds and hundreds of reports of strange objects in the sky when that first famous animal mutilation called uh, She Was Lady and the reporter made a mistake and called it Snippy, uh, a male, and it was a female named Lady. Reporters can make errors. Tonight, I apologize for saying Wisconsin instead of Minnesota. We had a script scramble for a second. Um, but even with that, it was that it was the UFOs, which we're now adding the words UAPs to, that so many people in the San Luis Valley were seeing that that became the association in many headlines. Uh, what are the UFOs doing? Why are they connected to animal mutilations? And I thought tonight that it was uh, especially relevant that this interview with this man on the East Coast uh, who had a dialogue that I've heard other people say that they have had where somebody in law enforcement or military order them to keep their mouths shut about UFOs, animal mutilations, and so forth. But they've never wanted to go on the record. And that was why I thought this was especially relevant tonight, that to hear from somebody who had that kind of a discussion. And it also, for me, raises a, a bigger question that I have felt over the last 40 some years is that Eisenhower and Truman and FDR and Churchill and those men in World War II that had all of this high strangeness developing in various ways coming out of World War II and they clearly knew that they were dealing with something that was from someplace else beyond planet Earth and that's why MJ-12 uh, was organized and it continued evolving. And I began to feel great sympathy, tremendous sympathy for the people who were on the inside who felt that under no circumstances could they tell the world for fear, as Churchill was allegedly quoted as saying, to Eisenhower, if we tell 
the stock markets will crash, religions will crumble, civilizations will fall apart, and we must keep this a secret for 50 years, which was in the 90s someplace, and we've far past that. And I can understand and feel a certain sympathy. But now we're in and approaching the middle of the 21st century, and it's becoming the big secret that not just the government knows, a whole bunch of us know. And it's beginning to be so artificially contrived in the suppression of the truth. And I get the feeling that today with all of the stories about new telescopes to look for life on other planets, that somebody has said, maybe we can announce that we're not alone in the universe if we can make an announcement and with the Webb telescope, we can photograph buildings or structures on Alpha Centauri or someplace, and then, then we'll introduce it that way. As if trying to cover up the true history by opening up with something that will be easier to stand in front of a microphone and talk to the public about. I feel that the observers in the film make a clear case that we are way past time, that we should all be told the truth, no matter what. So with that, Ian, I transfer over to you. Thank you very much, Linda. I've just got the super chats here. Moonbird. Hi, you guys. <laughs> Sorry, Linda. Okay, James Thiessen, Rebecca Cole, Joan O, William Gallison, Dave Goodridge, Ziggy Demeter, Miss Sammy, Miss Tammy One Two Five, Doctor Dolores Mize, Kevin Spina, Alina Gubina. Thank you. Oh, thank you so so much. I really, really, really appreciate all of you uh, who are helping Earth Files keep evolving and growing, and I just cheer you on, and thank you, thank you, thank you. What kind and tonight, of... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Linda. Yes, tonight we've got people in from... Um, I'm trying to count. It looks like we've got almost half of the states of the United States have checked in tonight. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, and uh, also... It's good that you featured Australia. Australia is the um, currently the fourth most popular geographical location where Earth files is viewed as well. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Australia has certainly paralleled the United States in terms of high strangeness over the decades. So uh, what have we got in terms of comments tonight about what uh, I presented? And then we'll go to questions. Yeah, on the comments, uh, loud booms, Linda, have been heard from Long Beach to San Diego on Monday, around about 8.30 a.m. as well. And I've got boom reports out of the Syracuse, New York area. Uh, there are several uh, news stories that seem to have developed in the last week while I was working on this one. And it may be that uh, by next week, I might have an update and that is uh, a good reason to extend to all of you who are experiencing either media reporting these booms or you've heard, I'm looking for people who have heard the boom themselves and might be able to talk about it. But that is from the East Coast to the West Coast that the boom reports are proliferating. That's right. Uh, we've got some... Um... We've got some uh, questions here about the cattle mutilations, Linda. Okay. Okay. Can you review the top hypotheses regarding the reason for animal mutilations, uh, the cattle in particular, and which makes the most sense to you yourself, Linda? And do you have any hope that these can or will eventually stop? Okay, we'll start with the first question, uh, the reasons why. Um, in my two-volume book, Glimpses of, uh, of Other Realities, Volume 1 and Volume 2, there are about a 1,000 pages 
between the two books. And it is Glimpses Volume 2 that has a 106-page chapter involving what the abductees at the time called the resurrection technology. And there are drawings that have been done by half a dozen people of tubes with light at the top and the bottom that sustain cloned bodies. And that the cloning has to do with both the non-humans and humans. The abductees see both humans and non-humans in these tubes. And one of them, one of the six in that chapter, Arowana, she gets a movie into her mind from one of the tall beings that is escorting her and showing her a vast room filled with these lighted tubes with all these different bodies in them. She gets a movie and a tel telepathic explanation that she, who was five feet, maybe four foot nine, um, worked in New Jersey, came from a black family, and had worked really hard in her life, and that the tall being sort of indicated to her that she was one of these tall beings in one of these lighted tubes. And the abductees in this chapter all do get the impression that there is something on a huge scale having to do with the recycling of life force through container bodies that are genetically produced by competing non-humans for a variety of tasks. Now, no one has proved at all that the genetic harvest of material from abductees and animal mutilations are used to create all kinds of body containers uh, to exist on Earth or throughout the solar system or someplace else. But as a hypothesis that has been discussed between me and some people who have worked in the government, I think that that is one of the hypotheses that is there, that there is genetic harvest to create clone bodies that the non-humans can then inhabit, control, to move around on Earth. And then humans don't recognize them as anything but other humans. And that that has been going on for thousands of years, not just now. And when you start looking at the lens of history from the Anunnaki and the Assyrians and the Sumerians and all coming up through history, it seems that there are many hypotheses now that proliferate about there being civilization on this planet far, far before 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. And if extraterrestrial civilizations were here 270 million years ago, as the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst told me in December 1999, then the waves and evolutions of civilizations not only on the earth, but structures on the moon. I have no doubt that there are ancient structures on the moon, on Mars, Ganymede, throughout the solar system. And it is as if even talking about possible extraterrestrial interaction with us 5,000 years ago in Egypt, people used to uh, throw up their hands at that. And then it was 12,000 years carbon dating for Gobekli Tepe. And now there are uh, suggestions that the Sphinx could be 45,000 years old or older. And everything is beginning to change more in keeping with the fact that the Earth has been inhabited 
by other intelligences way, way, way longer than two million years ago when uh, Homo erectus set up for the first time in Africa. So I think that we are not only challenged by understanding an the animal mutilations and the human abductions, perhaps paralleling, uh, because from both humans and animals, it's clear the genetic material is taken. And the parts we're missing is what exactly are the non-humans doing with what they harvest. But I do think that our government has a lot of information and that they choose to say that and pretend that, no, it's, yeah, we have a phenomena, but they've known for a very long time that they were dealing with other intelligences. So the animal mutilations and the human abductions, I guess the best box you can put both of them in is harvesting genetic material, harvesting material for sustenance by some for food. And then beyond that, it's hard to fill in any other gaps except for me to say to you all what I used to say to all of the farmers and ranchers that I would go to where there were fresh mutilations. There is no evidence of any wholesale interest in killing humans or, or doing anything beyond what they seem to do in terms of experimentation with material substances that are based on Earth. And then that suggests that what they do here on the Earth may be the way that they create materials that will be compatible with Earth and this particular system, and that if they were on 10 other planets, they might be doing 10 other things. This might be something hand-tailored to the Earth. But it's very, very difficult to give absolute certain uh, perspectives or facts because we have been in a world where governments and power brokers just did not want other life in the universe to rock the boat on our planet. But it's beginning to happen. The observers are part of it. The work that we're doing in Earth Files YouTube channel is part of it. The books that are being worked on, like Luis Elizondo, are part of it. And I guess we had hoped that would happen in one big announcement. We're not alone. Here's what we know. And the universe is a big place with a lot of life. And it's going to come in a different way, possibly through the telescopes and the reports that are coming from astrophysicists. That might be the way that they finally introduce it because that's what the government and MJ-12 decided would be the easiest way. Meanwhile, we can continue to have the discussions with people who have firsthand experiences with non-humans, with craft, with animal mutilations, and tell me if you feel the same way I do. There might have been a, an insecure, uh, sense about what is happening on the planet and are we in danger because of animal mutilations. But I think they have been going on for so long, going back at least to the early 60s and perhaps to the beginning of the 20th century. And they always seem to have a specific, specific focus Latitude, longitudinal grids seem to be part of the distribution of why mutilations happen in certain areas. And so you could say that we are being introduced to other life in the universe through their experimentation 
on our planet and our solar system. And then it seems to me it's more inevitable and not as, uh, well, not as threatening. It used to be that people were threatened by the idea even of other life, and I don't think that that is the case anymore. And I feel that one of the things that we need to always remember is that our government is working, I'm sure, with the allies that Lynn Buchanan and other remote viewers have talked about for so long, that there are at least two species that are helping and they are strong. And now is the difficult revolution that we're in to get through this revolution in which we come out the other side as a civilization in a huge universe, not the only civilization. That's the revolution that we're in. Okay, Ian. Linda, what is your most interesting or strangest case that you've ever investigated? In animal mutilations, human abductions, government cover-up, can you give me a category you're interested in? So, so, I think so it's, just, it's just a general one, but just go for it, Linda, whichever one you think is the most interesting or, uh, or strangest. I think that when I began receiving the correspondence and then meeting the people who were, um, had had the tube experience, that they were taken from the earth, taken someplace where there were all these tubes with the lights in the top and the bottom, and they were seeing humans and they were seeing non-humans in these tubes. And there were praying mantis, there were grays, there were tall black hairs, there were tall blondes. It was a mixture. And that those half a dozen people that are in that big chapter in my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, they all got the impression or telepathy or images that there was something very important about a concept that Arowana stressed. They say that it is very important that the soul, which I understand to be a quantum energy entity, that the soul be paired with a specific body container for X amount of time. And that there, the praying man has seemed to be overseeing this. And that when there had been, in the case of Linda Porter, she had had um, a fever when she was a child. It had weakened her heart. And this is what the non-humans told her. And that she was going to die too early in her human life. And therefore, they wanted her to see what they were doing, transferring her life, soul, energy into a clone and the clone of her was about the same age. She also saw them transfer life and soul energy from a man who on the table where he expired uh, and the gray and the, and the non-humans were showing that his heart was diseased, but they uh, had her watch as this golden light came out of him and moved across in front of where she was into one of the lighted tubes. And it was, as she said, it was recognizable. There were facial features that were recognizable between the two, but the one in the tube she thought was young, maybe in their 20s and 30s, and the man who died was much older. And Whatever her thought was, it provoked a reply from the being saying it is vital that the soul remain in the body container 
for X amount of time and that this is what we are overseeing. And they actually showed her that they were going to take the now revivified, cloned, younger body of the man and he was going to be placed in Australia. And his original family was in Wisconsin or Minnesota around the Great Lakes area. And they actually said to her telepathically, it's all in the book, the transcript, recorded transcript, he will have died as you have funerals in humans. They will have the funeral. But we have made sure that his soul and his body will continue and it will be in Australia and nobody will ever recognize him. Now, that to me, back in 1990 is when I started getting these communications and people were sending illustrations of the beam technology. And I was provoked. I was astonished. I was afraid. I, I think the tinge of fear was is underneath the ability to make and control and create genetically produced bodies by advanced civilizations. Does that make us more like a crop as opposed to an independent and vibrant civilization of life and consciousness and souls that I think humanity is. And I went through a period of time between 1990 and 1992 when I was starting to work on uh, Glimpses Volume 1 and then uh, eight or ten years later I finished Glimpses Volume 2. There was a period where I myself felt great confusion about what would be the purpose behind advanced civilizations that have these incredible craft and some people have been shown other planets with vast um, mind-blowing architecture, some just deserts, but at least other planets with other civilizations, why are they here? That used to bother me. Why are they coming here? I still don't have absolute answers, but I think the evolution over the last four decades that I can share with you is I really am convinced, I really am, that there is thought in the light, that the light is thought and consciousness. And maybe some vast experiment is taking place about good and evil and white and black and all of those subjects that we have talked about before. But in the end, the evolution through infinity of souls that are gathering information and continue to go through cycles of containers, I think that is the theatrical production we're in, if you want to put it that way. And because it hit me as so strange and almost scary between 1990 and 1993 when I was working on Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, it was one of those subjects that was a context for so many things that I have now and was doing then, there's so many facets. And the facets proliferate. And the complexity of what is out in this universe, what is interacting with our planet and our solar system, is still so complex that now all of the question of what could it add up to, could it be something like a takeover through our bodies, it's changed. It's changed to a kind of vibrant excitement that I feel every day that we are in a revolution and the revolution is absolutely necessary. 
if we really truly are going to be a civilization in this universe. Because we've got to get past being tribes that fight. And maybe in the revolution that we're in now, that we will come out in a decade or two with hard proof, introductions to allies, and the whole world will be completely different. But the difference is necessary for us to continue going on into the future as whole, healthy beings. That's what I honestly feel, see. So it was an evolution from a shocking and astounding series of letters and illustrations that came to me and the evolution toward understanding it better. In many ways, that was a huge turning point for me in my entire life, just as getting into animal mutilations. That one year making that film, I changed, it seemed to me, hugely in interest and my relationship with the sky at night and you look back on your life, all of us, and there will be those turning points. And sometimes you have to go through the unknown, the scary, the threatening, to come out on the other side with much more consciousness about so many other aspects that you see sometimes we get afraid just because we don't know anything. We have purposely been kept dumb and blind. And the more we know, I think the stronger we will be. And I am pulling for Homo sapiens sapien to get out of tribalism and get into being loving consciousness with each other in relationship with the thought that dwells in the light and the whole huge cosmic fabric of the divine field. That's what keeps me going. I hope it will help you too. Okay, Ian? Okay, Linda. Uh, the aliens could easily have their own livestock and raise their own cattle. Why do they want to return these animals to us? Why not just keep the entire animal? It's a recurring question. Yes, it is a question that I had in the discussion with Sheriff Tex Graves in Sterling, Colorado, on the very first trip from Channel 7 up to Sterling to talk with him. During uh, that time when I was looking at all of the Polaroids and looking at the timelines and we're talking about a cow that had been paralyzed and all of that, he turned to me, and he, I remember this vividly, and he said, one of the things that puzzles me, puzzles my deputies, we don't understand why the animals are returned at all. It is as if something is either giving us a warning or they are flaunting what they are able to do. What? To keep us intimidated by them? Why do they return these animals with these excisions, no tracks around them, which means the animal didn't walk there. And that's why law enforcement was looking to the sky as the up and down route to these bodies. And to this day, I don't think I have ever heard anybody suggest a hypothesis for that beyond there is a flaunted or flaunting quality to leaving these bodies. And if the intimidation is not directed at you and me and the general civilization, the intimidation might from the beginning have been directed to the power brokers, the governments of the planet, understanding the structures of how human civilization goes from small uh, leaders or government entities out to the civilizations or the populations that it may have been really directed toward uh, 
the governments and people because we had been, as Len Stringfield said, in his situation read, he said that he knew from his Air Force work that the United States had standing orders to shoot down UFOs. And that went back to the 50s. And he said, in the process, we lost pilots. And so there might have been, there probably was and probably is today, some kind of, we'll call either agreements in a military category having to do with they're going to do what they're going to do no matter what and leaving the carcasses of the animals uh, to be found may be the way they're putting insulation between them and military and government. That's a guess. But the other part of your question, will it stop? It hasn't stopped since at least the 1960s to date. It's animal mutilations have been ongoing through thick or thin of world affairs. I would wager that I think that animal mutilations were going on on the planet far before now and that the blood sacrifices in some places like the um, Yucatan and the Mayans and other places may have been part of the same ET relationship to Earth wanting certain harvests of certain ingredients. It may be that if we finally break through the big lies to the real truth, we're not alone in this universe at all, and that there are very advanced civilizations, maybe a thousand years beyond anything where we are now, that finally with that confirmation coming through science, coming through governments, coming through medicine, coming through everything, that it will make us all feel that we are now on ground together and it will be a positive. That's my hope, that it will make us stronger and positive in the end. And on that note, I look forward next week because it's going to be the day before Thanksgiving. And what I would like to do is a special holiday Q&A that starts right off with fast rounds of audience questions that would be managed by Ian with Brad ringing the bell at four minutes and don't sigh. I promise, I absolutely promise. I will stop in the middle of a sentence if I have to at that bell ringing. But I'd like to get through as many questions from you guys as possible and staying within that four minute. And then it may be a, it'll be a subject. I said, well, I'll bring that up in a, a deeper story later on. So join me by having your questions ready to go live. We're talking about live, not sending in any, anything before the show. And that would be at the start of our next Wednesday's Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast. We will go to you, you and your vitality and your thought and your energy and your support for the questions that you want to do fast rounds as a special Thanksgiving fun night. This was sort of a more serious night, so we'll have fun next night. And my tremendous thanks to all of you for your letters, for your emails, for your keeping me going with your questions and my wanting to try to bring us together around evolving facts and truth as much as possible in this exciting revolution that we are moving to rapidly. 
that we're not alone in this universe, and we humans have a lot to contribute to this cosmos if we can stop fighting each other. I love you guys. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select the language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>